And one of them, which is in Raj Gara, which is one of my favorites, you know, is this one. It's called An Ban Jia Milagi.
The mutable form of ghazal was nurtured, therefore, by the courtesans and the tabaiyats, who were steeped in the traditions of dance, poetry, literature, music. And it is not surprising at all that, in my opinion, some of the finest ghazal singers are women. Abhidhar Parveen, today, Parika Khanam, Nayara Noor, Malika Kukra, Kota Maktar, you know. But there is one woman who, again, I have singled out, who towers above all of them. I mean, these are this is my subjective opinion. And um, you are free to have your favorites, you know. So, um, one woman who towers above all of them. Her name is Dippi. Dippi. B I D D I. Dippi. And in 1919, in a mission school in Faizaba, this diva, Gohar Jan, heard a six-year-old girl sing, a Marcia. The Marcia was, Amma Mori Bhaiya Ko Bhejo Re Ke Saban Aya. Okay? Maya Mori Bhaiya Ko Bhejo, Amma Mori Bhaiya Ko Bhejo Re Ke Saban Aya, which she had learned from her mother, Mushtari Bhai. And Gohar heard her and predicted that if trained, this woman would become the fame, one of the most famous singers in the world. And her prediction came true. And um, this Bibi carved her identity and became the Mallika Aikala of Tarimai. We all know of Tarimai, popularly known as Degama. And I'm playing. She began her career actually as a courtesan again and sang very assertively. And you know, there's, there's a certain exuberance in her voice in her earlier songs. And in those days, because you had to record, and the English who were recording didn't know who's who, and people they couldn't pronounce the names, they didn't know the song, they would ask you to say what you sung and who you are. So all singers used to say, I am so and so. And you hear this song and you see how they come after S. Assertively says, <laughs> almost demanding to be heard, you know. That was the competition and that was the desire to carve out your own identity. And the only form or only thing, only instrument that you had was your music. <coughs> One of the early cousins of Deva <laughs> And she forsakes, she stops singing completely. 
and she wanted to transform herself into an aristocrat. So she made radical changes to her lifestyle and, you know, and to confirm as a wife of an aristocrat. But she couldn't remain happy for too long without her music and needed to sing to become herself again. She fell ill and doctors said that the only way she can become okay is if she's allowed to sing again. So she came back. She re-emerged, but this time with a new idea. A more respectable, not of the wife, not a court singer, but an aristocrat. She didn't sang, sing in Kothas, she didn't sing in salons, or she sang for all India radio. She sang for public concerts that were organized, organized by the government or public institutions. Her music was more assured and there was a gravitas in her voice. And now she used to announce her name differently. And you can hear what she said. आप से बातें करने का मौका तो मुझे पहली बार ही मिला है इसलिए ये कहे बगैर नहीं रह सकती कि मैं बेहद खुश नसीब हूँ जो ऐसे मुल्क में मैंने जन्म दिया जहाँ की फजाएं संगीत से मोहतर हैं जहाँ के लोग फन और फनकार से मोहब्बत करते हैं मुझे भी एक फनकार की हैसियत से आपका बहुत प्यार मिला है आपके प्यार का शुक्रिया हमेशा मैंने अपनी गायकी से अदा किया है Find herself professionally and personally, and she became an icon of the courtly culture of Lucknow in a totally new way, without having the stigma attached to the courtly culture. And not only that, I think she became an icon of the high culture of the nation. I mean, in the 40s and 50s, I think she uh, the 60s as well. You know, she was a ruling. She was the uh, the final word in the refined traditions of poetry, literature, music in India. And you know, she was so coveted and so sought after that she would actually index and mark a poet if she sang his song or his poetry. She was she was therefore, I think, a delight of every poet who wanted her to sing for her. Here is Kathy as me doing the same. And before you, you know, look at the, Kathy Yazni says the shape, and I believe that, you know, she can interpret it almost instantly. I think there must be some physical structure in mind. But she's sitting there, and he recites the poetry, she must have thought of a little bit the basic, and she just sings it out. सब अजनबी है यहाँ किसको कौन पहचान सब अजनबी है
So, you know, I mean, as an interpreter of poetry, she was a delight for poets. And, you know, contextual sensitivity of the poem and, and a certain degree of musical flexibility that she had as a great singer <coughs> led her to develop a very unique way of singing Ghazal. And I, we can discuss that later on. But one of the things that she did, in my opinion, is that she brought about a certain classical texture to singing Ghazals, which no one has been able to do like that, you know, and, uh, you know, and in such a way that, uh, you know, the emotional volatility and uh, the intimacy of performance that was there in a, in a, in a, in a court or a, or, or a Kurdistan culture uh, was completely removed. She purged it of that, she brought a certain classical dimension to it, you know, and she transformed this music form. And not only that, you know, she sang Khumri's, she sang Kajri, she sang, oh, many of them, you know that Begum was a very versatile artist. In fact, one of the things that I often talk about, and I'd like to say it here, just in a, one line, is that in Indian musical traditions, there are no boundaries. This whole idea of classical music and non-classical music is a Western way of classification. You know, classical music, there's nothing like classical music in India. There is Khayal Gaiti, the Raag, folk, and everything has Raag in any. And I'll show that in the film music. But Begum Akhtar sang everything, you know, on Tumi's or whatever. And she rose above these categorizations that I just mentioned. And one of the most fascinating things is that once she delighted audiences in Pakistan, and she went there, where she improvised one of her songs, urging reconciliation and dissolving national differences by singing Amri Atariya Pehao Kavari. And you know, she was a great when she sang this song. Just to beat one to give you a <laughs> 
you know many of them. Let's move on to the first. Now, you know, in the cosmopolitan Bombay, the multiplicity of you know musical traditions that converge into one song, and the the pioneers, Himanshu Ray and Devika Rani, famous actor and actress, set up the new theatre. And they had a German technician who would record all this. And they realized that they had to do a song which, which could bind together the national diversity by getting elements from everywhere to be represented somehow in the song. The problem was that you could not find musicians and singers who knew this idiom. So they started looking around for a music director who could direct in three minutes this whole idea of a film song. And they found a Parsi lady called Khurshid Minoshar Homji in Lucknow, in the Morris College of Music. She's popularly known as uh, Saraswati Devi. She was the, one of the first uh, music directors of Hindi film. I was the first, but one of the first three or four people who were directing. You know, and Saraswati Devi was a trained classical musician and all that. She had to figure out a way to direct music. Second problem was that in those days, films did not have a playback singing system. Everything that you sang on the set was recorded. So the actor and the actresses had to sing. In Ashut Kanya, Devika Rani and Ashok Kumar had to sing. And she struggled for two months to make them sing this song. After 60 days of practice, they sung this song, which you can hear it. It's like a, it's like a nursery rhyme. You know? <laughs> Actually, was from a family of Mirasis who sang in Gurdwara, Shabakir Tanuran, 
but now we folk. And he completely changed the concept of music. The last two songs, I and mean, I'm not getting into the dissection I could, you know, of film music. The last two songs you heard had the Bengal influence. There, was, there were many things there which had, you know, which you see Bengal in there. When when uh, Master Bulam Haider came, he brought with him the pulsating rhythm of Punjab. And he changed in the film music. But not only that, he discovered three great artists. One was Nur Jahan, the other was Shamshar Begum, the third was Lata Mangeshwar. And uh, let's hear this song of which was in Khazanchi in 1941 again, super hit of that time, Shamshar Begum by Gulam Haidar. What is interesting in this song is the rhythm, the pulsating rhythm that he creates, but he does not use a single percussion instrument in this song. He does this through the cello and the violin. <laughs> Thank you. 
fraction of a second and then says Aga, that's Nur Jahan. So in 1947 we had India had its independence but we lost Nur Jahan. Pakistan leaving us with this extremely poignant song, which is one of my favorites from Anmol Ghali. <laughs>
cujo nome é Nadia. Nadia. So you know, we kind of globalized and merged with the Western tradition. And that was my last slide. I think uh, there's never enough time to discuss everything on music, and, uh, but I do hope that I have been able to show you the symbiotic relationship between music and Thank you. Thank you.